research and go back and uh, dig up some things that will be pertinent and relevant to what you're doing. And so we encourage you to, to keep these devotionals. Amen? We're in Romans chapter 9, and uh, I will say to you that Romans is one of the solid doctrinal books of the Bible, uh, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. And we're in chapter 9, and starting at verse 1, Paul says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Um, these are some very hard words. And one of the things that I will tell you is that Paul loved his people so much that he wanted them saved. What lesson do we draw from this? You ought to love people so much that you want to see them saved. Okay? Because God loves people. Uh, I, I've said over the years, and it bears repeating, that God is not as concerned about programs as he is people. Okay? He's in the people business. Um, and so we need to be concerned about people um, and share the gospel with people. Um, probably the most quoted verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting Life. And then the next verse says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so Paul, who has a heart after God's and who loves his own nation, his own people, says that I would that everybody was saved. He also says, If I could give up my salvation for the salvation of all of my kinsmen, he said, I would rather do that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I love people. I ain't giving up my salvation for nobody. <laughs> okay, because I don't want to spend one moment in hell. Okay, uh, brother, sister, I love you. I'm trying to tell you as best I can that you need to be born again. You need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But Jesus died in our place. And since he did it, my dying in your place is not going to help. Okay? So he gave his sacrifice once and for all. And it is so great until it can satisfy even the worst sinner. So Paul says, look at this again. He says, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And I'll tell you, that's some great love right there, right? Uh, he was so distressed that he wanted his people to be saved. I think that, um, you know, if you come to worship um, in a church, come to Sunday school, come to Bible class, in worship experiences, witnessing to people, studying your word, you understand and you have an appreciation that God loves people. And if God loves people, then you ought to love people. And here's the thing. You may not love what people do, but you still ought to love people, right? Um, some people have actions that are not in concert with Scripture, but it doesn't mean that God has given up on them. Praise God. And I'm glad that God didn't give up on me, right? I'm glad that he looked beyond my faults and saw every one of my needs. Um, and so that's the 
heart, and that's the prayer we ought to have for everybody that we come in contact, that we want them to be saved. Amen? Verse 4, he says, who are Israelites? Paul was an Israelite. Some of you all may know that Paul had dual citizenship, right? He was a Roman, but he was also an Israelite, okay? Um, to whose uh, pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever amen so here listen to what Paul says that God has given his people okay they were Israelites. First of all, Israel was God's chosen people. Okay, somebody may ask the question, well, why was Israel God's chosen people? And the answer is simply this. He had to start with somebody. If it started with you, some other people might ask the question, why? But he had to start with somebody. And he picked Israel to be his people so that they could mirror to the rest of the world what it looked like to be a follower of him. They had a great assignment to show other people. And I will tell you that uh, during that time in the Old Testament, most people were polytheistic. Poly means many theistic gods. They serve multiple gods. You know, when you talk about the Egyptians, we know that they serve multiple gods. Um, one of the reasons why God had to send 10 plagues upon Egypt is because whenever he would send a plague, it was to mock one of the gods of the Egyptians. Pharaoh, when a plague would come, he would go to one of his gods to try to uh, erase or to under, undo what God had sent. And when his gods failed to be able to do it, God proved that he was greater than the gods of the Egyptians, right? All of the other people around the Israelites had multiple gods. When you talk about um, the Greeks, uh, we get mythology, Greek mythology. Uh, they had a pantheon of gods. The Romans were borrowers and they borrowed the gods of the Greeks. That's why if you've ever studied mythology, you'll find that gods had two different names. They had Greek names, but they also had Roman names. You know, you know some of them. You know, Zeus was the, was the father of the gods, right? Aphrodite, you know, uh, Diana, um, Neptune, Pluto. All of these various gods were over in the minds of the Greeks and the Romans, different parts of nature. Um, and they would actually pray to the gods uh, for power, for deliverance, for uh, crops. So the Israelites were not polytheistic, they were monotheistic. Mono means one, theistic God, so they believed in one God. As a matter of fact, all Jews know one scripture by heart. It's Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay? So they serve one God in a sea of multiple gods that the other people worship. So their assignment was to show the rest of the world what it looked like to follow Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai, right? Um, a God who, who, who so shows up in multiple ways, but he's one, right? And so uh, the, the real message of the Old Testament is that the Israelites failed miserably. They failed to show the rest of the world how it was to follow God. Um, 
And you see it, you know, clearly when they left Egypt. You know, God took them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And yet, as they're going to the promised land, they gave all kinds of problems and excuses to Moses. They murmured against God. They did all kinds of things. Uh, and in, while they fighting and kicking, God was still making a way out of no way for them. So, I'm just going to throw this in free just because you're here. In the New Testament, God sends another person to show the world what it looks like to be a follower of God. His name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is called, watch this, the new Israelite who comes to show what the old Israelites failed to do. And so Jesus, if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus shows us what it looks like to follow God. And whenever Jesus, you always hear him, before a miracle was ever wrought, he'd always pray to his father. He would tell us, you know, I didn't come to do my will, but I came to do the will of him who sent me. And so he showed us how to follow God. Praise God. And so Paul says, God has uh, favored the Israelites. He gave, he adopted them, right? Um, at Sinai, God married Israel and even put a ring on her finger. Somebody made a song, put a ring on it, right? He, he married Israel because of his great love for her. And one of the great uh, tragedies of the Old Testament is that G God was a, a, a great husband, but Israel was a deceitful wife and went whoring after other men. That's certainly the message of Hosea, right? Um, the book of Hosea really shows how good God is and how um, wayward Israel was. Okay, so he's given, he adopted them. And by the way, if you're saved, the Lord has adopted you. Amen. Now, if you know anything about adoption, uh, when you are adopted by a family, you lose all rights and privileges of your previous family but you gain all rights and privileges of your adopting family. And if God adopts you, I got some good news for you, that uh, everything that God has, it's yours. Amen. We become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And uh, it is no secret what God will do, what he's done for others. He'll do the same thing for you. It's a great thing to be adopted into the family of faith. Amen? Amen. So they were adopted. They had glory. Right? Um, think of how many times God showed himself strong uh, before other people through the Israelites. Um, you remember when the Israelites were fighting the Philistines and they had a champion named Goliath. You all remember that story very well. And God raised up David, a little boy, to go out and fight the giant. And God showed himself strong. Because the Bible says that uh, David just took some stones and with a slingshot, hurled the stone toward the giant. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit guided that stone to that giant's head. And after he oops upside his head, he fell down where David could handle him. And David took the giant sword and cut his head clean off his neck. And when they got back to Israel, they had a ticker tape parade. And the women of the city said that Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. So God had shown himself strong multiple times in the Old Testament through the nation of Israel. Matter of fact, when they, would, when they would fight, God would go before them to win the victory. Praise God. So he had shown himself strong. They had glory. They had the covenants. What is a covenant? 
A covenant is agreement, right? And, and usually a covenant is agreement between two or more parties, right? Well, whenever God made a covenant, he always kept his side of the bargain. The problem was that people didn't keep their side of the bargain. And so there were different kinds of covenants. And I'm going to tell you at least a couple of covenants. There, uh, there were covenants that were contingent upon what Israel did. So we call them if-then covenants. So, you know, God would say, if you do this, I'll do so-and-so. Right? And so I would encourage you to go through the Old Testament and and see where there are if-then propositions. For instance, uh, 2 Corinthians, or uh, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. And so if you want God's promises, then you've got to do some things before that. That's called an if-then covenant, okay? But then there were covenants that were based upon simply that God was going to do some things irregardless of what Israel did, okay? And God is always true to his word. God, if God said it, that settles it. Praise God. Um, and God is so great until all God has to do is speak and things come into existence. And so he, he adopted Israel. He showed his glory through Israel. They had the covenants. They, they were different than other people who didn't have covenants with God. They had the law. Uh-oh. Here we go. So when you talk about the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses to give to Israel. Okay? So God is the law giver. Moses was the law receiver. And Israel was the law recipients. Now when you talk about the Ten Commandments, the first three commandments talk about our relationship with God, right? Then there is a transitional uh, law that talks about the Sabbath. Then the rest of the laws talk about our relationship with one another. And so when you think about a cross, which is the symbol of Christianity, uh, the vertical beam represents our relationship with God. And that relationship has to be there in order for there to be a right relationship with our fellow man. So really the cross is the embodiment of the Ten Commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus was asked in the New Testament, what are the two greatest commandments? He said, the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and body. The second is like unto the first, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commandments sum up the Ten Commandments. Love of God, love of neighbor. Guess what? Nobody was able to keep the law except one. Jesus comes to, to do what nobody else could do. And Jesus comes to do what the law couldn't do. Because here's what the law could do. The law showed you the righteousness of God, but it also so showed you the wretchedness of humanity. Okay? Why the wretchedness of humanity? Because humanity couldn't reach the standard of a holy God. And so if you're trying to live by the law, you're living de a defeated life because you can't keep it. So what did Jesus do? Jesus came to die in our place. So when you see him hanging on the cross, he is our substitute. He is our 
go-between, right? He is our advocate. He is our intercessor. And so he takes your sins and my sins on himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be saved from sin. Oh, my goodness. And so we sing songs like, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. And so what's exciting is that because Israel couldn't keep the law, Jesus could keep the law. Now the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In other words, I become a law keeper not because of me keeping the law, but because I've been adopted into the family of faith. Jesus kept the law and because I'm hid in him, I am reckoned as a law keeper. So we can't keep the law in and of ourselves, but because we are adopted into the household of faith, we are reckoned as law keepers. I hope you caught that because that is absolutely wonderful, but it's also exciting. Praise God. So Jesus is our covenant keeper. He is our law keeper. But then he goes on a step further. He said that the Israelites had the true worship. Right? True worship. What? True worship. Well, yeah. Because if you're not worshiping the right God, you're worshiping an idol. And idolatry was a huge problem in the Old Testament. Right? So much so that Israel even fell into idolatry. And when they fell into idolatry, well, let me just say it like this. If you want to make God angry, put an idol in front of him. Okay? Now, Israel did that, and I'll tell you what happened. Uh, when the northern kingdom fell into idolatry, God allowed the Assyrians to come and almost annihilate the northern kingdom. That was in 721 B.C. Then when the southern kingdom, Judah, or the house of David, when they fell into idolatry, God raised up Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and in 586 B.C., they came from the north and took Israel into captivity. Captivity would last 70 years because of their idolatrous ways. Because be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God does not look favorably on idolatry. Okay? But Israel had the true worship. All they had to do was follow God and obey his commandments and God would do great things for her. Got some good news for you today. <laughs> if you follow the Lord and if you do what he says, God will bless you. God knows where you are. God knows how to promote. And even when other folk overlook you, God will elevate you. Praise God. I'm glad about that. Uh, he knows your address. Praise God. If you don't think God knows you, let me remind you that every strand of hair on your head is already numbered by God. David says in the 139th Psalm that every day of my life is written in God's book. Jeremiah chapter 1 says before my mother and father uh, came together that he formed us in our mother's womb. He knew us, praise God. Amen. And so God knows you better than you know yourself, praise God. So we ought to worship him because true worship starts with him, with God. Amen? Amen. They had the promises. 
God, God made some great promises, right? I, um, here's some of the great promises that he promised. He told Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, he said uh, uh, five things, okay? They're called the Abrahamic covenant. God said, I'm going to make your name great. Is his name great? Well, we're still talking about Abraham. Abraham is the father of many nations. He is a father of three of the great religions of the world. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All name him as their father. Okay? He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And the nation of Israel comes out of the loins of Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless them that bless you. And certainly everywhere Israel went, God would bless them. You know, when they got to Jericho, the people of Jericho already knew they were defeated. When the spies heard what they were saying, they said, you know, we can't fight against uh, Israel's God. Because you remember what he did to, to Pharaoh and how he opened up the Red Sea? They said, we are already defeated. Because God always goes before his people and fights the battle. Many times, all you got to do is show up. Or as somebody said, God don't need no coward soldiers. Oh, my goodness. He said, I'm going to bless them that bless you. He said, I'm going to curse them that curse you. And certainly, people who cursed Israel ran into problems. Um, and then he said, and through your seed, all nations of the world will be blessed. And certainly God pulls that one off in the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God. Matter of fact, I'm thinking about writing my second book right in that area. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, so he, 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 they had promises. You know, Israel was a blessed people. He said they had the fathers. Okay. And the patriarchs of Israel were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac. And you'll hear the Lord saying throughout the Old Testament, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God of Abraham because Abraham is the father of the faithful. Okay, when you talk about faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You got to follow God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay? So you got to have faith. And Abraham was the father of the faithful. Right? Isaac rested in his father's faith. Um, and you go to chapter 22 of Genesis, when uh, God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and offer him up as a sacrifice. Uh, you don't hear Isaac fighting his father as he's going to be the sacrifice. But he's laying on the altar, and Abraham is about to offer him up to God. And you all know what happened. Up on top of that mountain, God showed Abraham a new name, that he is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. He said, there's a ram in the thicket. And so Isaac rested in his father's faith. Jacob was a rascal. I always tell people, if God can be Jacob's God, he can be anybody's God. Because Jacob, when you read the, the life of Jacob, even at his birth, he was grabbing on the heel of his brother. You know, Jacob and Esau were twins, right? And uh, he's, he was a, a grabber, always trying to snatch stuff away from, from Esau. He even stole his birthright. You all know that story. Um, goes down to his uncle Laban's house, tried to steal all of his stuff, you know. Uh, even when he gets by himself, he has to wrestle with God in order to get the blessings of the Lord. 
uh, and God changes his name uh, Jacob to Israel. And his 12 sons become the 12 heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they had the fathers, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Praise God. And then they had the Messiah. And Jesus would come out of the lineage of Israel. Jesus was a Jew. Amen? Amen. Uh, that's why Jesus said, you know, it is when he came, he came to his own. And his own received him not. But to as many as received him, gave he power to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Fast forward to the New Testament. You know, the Israelites, when they saw Jesus, they said, you know, we of our father Abraham. They thought they were saying something great. And Jesus said, if you knew Abraham, you should know me. Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> and they looked at him and they said, how can you be older than Abraham? You are yet, you know, 30 years of age. But they didn't know that they were talking to the great I am. But Jesus is... He, he, he is uh, before time, he's after time, he's above time, he's below time. If you wait on him, he's always on time, even when he seems late. Like at the graveside of Lazarus, he shows up, he's on time. Because he don't wear Seikos, hallelujah, and he don't wear... Timexes, but when he shows up, he shows up on time. Somebody said, weeping men do it for a night. Joy come in the morning. So if you're going through a night of pain, of suffering, trials, hold on. Because morning is coming, and joy comes in the morning. Amen. Oh, my goodness. So, so all of these things... Paul lays out, just in these few verses, all of the blessings that God had given Israel. And in spite of everything that God did for Israel, they turned their back on God. And so Paul, in these first three or four verses, is saying to them, I would that you're saved. I, I want you to be saved. If I could give my salvation up, I'd give it up for you. And God has given you so much that you should be saved. And you have uh, turned your back on God. You know, if there is one message that we know is true today, God has been good to everybody. And yet, there are a lot of people today who are just like the Israelites. In spite of all of the blessings that God has given, folk are still turning their back on God. But I will say this to you, going back to the devotional, you better pack up because Jesus is coming. And when, he's come, when he comes back, he's not coming back for excuses. Praise God. But he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And he's going to burn this place up because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth because the former heaven and the former earth will pass away. In other words, God is preparing a prepared people for a prepared place. And so that's a whole bunch of information in a short few verses. But I'm going to stop right there and ask, are there any questions or comments about any of that? Because time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Anybody got any questions or comments?
Only thing I can say, Pastor, is I'm just very thankful that I'm adopted. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> That's a good response. <laughs> That's a good response. I am too. I am too. Absolutely. All right. Well, guess what? We're not going to go any further. That's that's a whole bunch for tonight. Um, and so it's a, give you something to chew on. Go back and revisit it and see all of the great promises that Paul talks about here. Uh, because he's going to lay out um, some real definitive uh, points that, that people are going to need to do in order to be saved. It's going to flow right into chapter 10. Here's the coming attraction. Uh, when I was a little boy, whenever we would have revival, they would always quote or read from Romans chapter 10. And it made such an impact on me until I can almost quote the 10th chapter of, Genesis, of, of uh, Romans. Because it would start out by saying, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you, you hear already the same kinds of things that he starts out in chapter 9, he's going to reiterate in chapter 10. So let's continue to read in chapter 9. We'll pick up at verse 5 uh, next week. I, uh, I've, I've talked to leadership, and we're going to be here again next week. So uh, I'll be with you, and uh, uh, we'll go a little further. Amen. And uh, I want to tell you I love you. I, you know, I'm praying for you. I believe God is going to do some extraordinary things in your life if you just continue to hold on to God's unchanging hand. Praise God. Anybody have any closing prayer requests as we get ready to bring closure to tonight? Pastor, always, uh, we just should keep our young people lifted in prayer. Always. Yeah. Praise God. Anybody else? Uh, I would pray for safe travel for your wife. Yeah. Praise God. She's, yeah. <laughs> I've had multiple conversations with her today, and she's doing, she's doing good. And so, yeah, we are praying for her uh, safety and uh, that she'll continue to do what uh, she needs to do. Amen. Um. And again, we need to pray for certainly the leadership of this country, um, especially in this election. Glad that these elections are over with. You know, that, that they can take all these signs down and stop all of these advertisements on TV, and we can get down to some real work. Yes, Giovanni. Yes, Tabin. Yeah, Giovanni. <laughs> My, uh, I got a cousin that asked for a prayer. Okay. All right. Okay. Are we good? Let's bow our heads then. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for all that you do on our behalf. We've read and we've heard how much you did for Israel. But we also know you've done a great deal for us. And for that, we say thank you. thank you. We ask God for your continued watching over us, for your leading, your guiding. God, we can't make this journey by ourselves. We need you every step of the way. And so God, do what only you can do. We pray for those who have asked for prayer, God, uh, continue to be with those who are bedridden, for those who are at home uh, nursing various uh, ailments. God, we pray healing 
in the matchless name of Jesus. God, for Tabin's cousin who asked for a prayer, we ask God that you would intervene. Whatever the problem, we know you're a problem solver. And so God, have your way. We pray for uh, our school kids, uh, for uh, teachers, faculty members, God, for administrators. God, that, that the school year will be a safe year. And God, that learning can take place. We pray for their safety, God, in the name of Jesus. And God, for all of the people who have been elected to the various offices in these United States, God, help them to not lean to their own understanding, but in all their ways, acknowledge you that you might direct their path. And God, for that and so much more, we say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us on tonight. Come back and see us on next week when we will again go to God's word. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you is our prayer.